Great. Hi, my name is Lonnie Leithold. I'm a professor at North Carolina University. Uh, you might wonder about the North Carolina part. Uh, I came to North Carolina after receiving my PhD at UW back in the Pleistocene. So, uh, and I've been working on projects in the Northwest um, ever since. Um, so could we go to the next slide? My students and my colleagues and I have been working on lakes uh, in and around Olympic National Park for about the past decade, uh, including uh, Lake Quinault, Lake Crescent, and uh, Lake Ozette, or Ozette Lake, I'm told it should be called. Uh, and uh, next slide. Um, as Danny just uh, set me up for, um, Ozette Lake's a great place to study earthquake deposits. It lies uh, close to the Cascadia subduction zone and far from some of the crustal faults that uh, affect some of the other lakes that, that Carl Wegman will be talking about. So in, in 2019, in, in order to compare it to the other lakes that we've worked on, uh, we went to uh, Ozette Lake and collected 14 sediment cores, uh, much shorter than the ones that Danny was talking about. The average was about one meter in length, and we collected them from the north uh, excuse me, the east and west uh, sides of uh, the basins that, that Danny discussed, uh, our cores went back roughly about 1300 years. Next slide. So as he mentioned, there are turbidites, or we, we more generally call them event layers in Ozette Lake that record earthquakes, the last of which was deposited during the 1700 Cascadia earthquake. Uh, and in between those layers are, are the sediments that accumulate slowly. We call them everyday or background deposits, uh, little bits of mud and sand, well, mostly mud and clay, actually, that, that are deposited uh, as the rivers flood in, in the wintertime, uh, and they pile up slowly on the lake bottom. And uh, so we, in our course, sampled only the four upper foremost event layers, uh, and they bear the hallmarks of, of these type of earthquakes deposits that we see in other lakes around the world. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that we focused on were the sediments deposited between those event layers. Um, in this image, we have uh, three cores shown, and uh, what we can see is event layer one, which is the 1700 uh, Cascadia earthquake deposit. What we noticed that in the in-between times, in the everyday uh, sediment accumulation, there were these very distinctive uh, lighter and darker beds or bands. And here we see in core 3A about 320 years of everyday sediment accumulation. We can trace these lighter and darker color bands across the lake. It's almost like a barcode. And based on sediment accumulation rates of about a half to, to uh, nine millimeters, uh, 0.9, that should be millimeters per year, uh, these represent um, sort of decadal uh, changes in the environment. So they're not uh, yearly deposits, but they're telling us about some kind of change that's happening on a decadal scale. Next slide, please. So we analyzed these darker and lighter uh, bands or beds. We looked at sediment density uh, via uh, gamma rays and, and C uh, we did a CT scan. Uh, we looked at the color spectroscopy to look at clay minerals and chlorophyll A content. We looked at the organic matter. And what we discovered was that the lighter color layers are denser. They have more clay minerals. They have a lower organic carbon content but the source of the organic matter is about the same in both the lighter and darker layers. Next slide, please. Um, so based on these results, we hypothesize that what the light color layers represent are relatively wet periods. Again, these are sort of wet decades when stream flow was relatively high and a lot of fine material clay was dispersed throughout the lake. Whereas the darker layers record drier periods when the normal rain of algae and plant debris to the lake bottom is less diluted with mineral particles. Next slide, please. And so we wanted to test that hypothesis by comparing our uh, measurements from the cores to actual precipitation records. So what you see on the left here is a uh, cool season, that is October to March precipitation uh, on an annual basis in black. 
and in red is a 10 year mean. Um, and then we use a statistical technique to compare that record to the density patterns we see in the Ozette Lake sediments. We need to use that statistical technique. It's called dynamic time warping because the sediments are not accumulating at a, a steady pace. They're, we have to allow for variations in, in the pace at which they're piling up on the lake bottom. So this tool, dynamic time warping, allows us to kind of stretch and shrink the record to see how well they match. And what you'll notice in, in red here and the graph on the right is the actual precipitation record, the 10 year average. And in black are the patterns from the core of density, which goes with color. The, again, the denser layers tend to be the lighter layers. And you'll see that the, the match is really remarkable. And so we conclude that we've got a great record of cool season precipitation in, in this graph, we're looking back to about 1900 when precipitation was first recorded in this uh, area. So the next step and the next slide, please, is to try to see if we can go back further. And so we compared the, the Ozette Lake density and color record to longer term reconstructions of precipitation. We, we compared them to a couple, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about this thing called the North American Seasonal Precipitation Atlas, uh, which is essentially a reconstruction of precipitation uh, in cool and warm seasons across the entire uh, North America. Uh, and this is based on tree rings, tree rings that are sensitive to cool or warm season precipitation. You can see an example here of 1700 where you see evidence for that was a rather uh, wet time in uh, Pacific Northwest, 1700, again, when the last big earthquake occurred. Next slide, please. So we make that comparison again between the density and color of sediments in Ozette Lake to this long-term precipitation reconstruction. And again, we see a very close match. It's not perfect, but it's quite good. Again, red here is the actual data from Ozette. Black is a seasonal reconstruction for the, the cool season by Stolle et al. And you can see a few things on here. One is that there are some notably dry periods, which I've marked in pink, for example. Uh, near the top, we see the 1920s to 40s. We see uh, a very dry interval about in the 900s. So, so you can see that those really dry times are uh, spaced far apart. And we see some wet intervals. Next slide, please. Uh, so one more use. So we've learned something about climate here. What about the earthquakes? Well, this uh, tuning, let's say, of the precipitation record at Ozette to that that's been reconstructed with trees allows us to put on much narrower limits on the ages of those top four earthquakes than is possible with C14. And so here we have our own data from Ozette Lake dating the upper four turbidites as well as those we get from the reconstruction and compare to those from other archives along the entire of Cascadia. Next slide, please. So I'm almost out of time, but uh, just to conclude, what we've discovered is that Ozette Lake contains a really remarkable record of decadal scale variations in precipitation that goes back over a thousand years and I'm sure further. Uh, and by comparing the Lake Ozette climate record to tree ring chronologies, we can really start to fine tune estimates of the past uh, ages of the past Cascadia subduction earthquakes. And I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you, Lonnie. Any questions for Lonnie? I don't see any in the chat. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Getting some good applause here. That's good. <laughs> I guess, uh, I, well, here we go. Have you applied lead CCM dating to the core tops? Uh, we have not, Danny. I, I've seen work that uh, Andy Ritchie did earlier on that. So we have not done that yet. Okay. Uh, have, and the next question, have you or any of your partners compared the past precipitation to those in recent decades? Yeah, our, so I had shown that comparison. Our cores uh, were missing the very top 
So our, our reconstruction actually starts around 2010. We're, we're missing uh, the very most top, but hopefully uh, we can do that, look at the very top uh, in the future. Uh, Kim Bray has a question from the Ho Tribe. Uh, have you or any of your partners compared the past precipita <laughs> precipitation patterns to those in recent decades, uh, e.g. identified yeah, changes? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, we don't. Uh, we have not been able to look um, at sediments younger than 2010 with these particular cores, but that would certainly be an interesting thing to see. Um, we're matching up to precip actual precipitation measurements, so um, those data are are probably the best place to look. <laughs> 